So, hi, I'm Toby. Uh, thanks for coming. It's really great to be here. So, coroutines, what can't they do? Uh, what can they do? What are they? How do they work? Uh, hopefully, we'll uh, make a little bit of progress um, answering or at least maybe asking these questions. So, start with a little uh, intro to set the context. Uh, so, what am I going to be talking about? Uh, so there's lots of different things that uh, get called coroutines. There's lots of things called coroutines in languages that aren't C++. There's lots of things called coroutines in C++, but I'm specifically talking about um, the technical specification called C++ extensions for coroutines, um, also known as N4680 um, to its friends uh, currently. So um, I'll, I'll just refer to that as the TS uh, from now on. Um, there's a little, little link there. Um, it's just a little, there's a little screenshot of uh, the front page, just to give you a flavor for how exciting it is inside. Um, it's actually, it's actually quite, quite an easy read. Um, it's quite short. It's quite nice. So, but what's the, what's the TS talking about? Um, well, apart from coroutines, it is an extension to C++. That includes uh, three new keywords uh, and some new customization points. So that's uh, largely what I'll be talking about in this talk, um, how those keywords work, what the customization points are. Um, and what it does is enables um, some, some new kinds of control flow, well, new to C++. So uh, next bit's sort of, uh, I'm gonna run through how the, how the transformation inside the compiler works, not in complete low-level detail, but uh, sort of at a, at a source transformation level. So first of all, what's a coroutine? So it is a generalization of a function. So coroutines are functions, um, but they're functions that have extra capabilities. So on the, on the left there is a diagram that shows um, a caller calling a normal function. So when you call a function, Control flow transferred to the function. The function runs to completion until it returns, and then control flow transfers back to the caller at the point where it called the called the function. Uh, so that, that should be pretty familiar uh, to people who have called functions before. Um, the interesting thing about that, well, I guess the boring thing about that is that um, is that the the function that's called runs to completion and the caller waits for it and doesn't continue until the function's finished. So on the right, uh, we have a coroutine. So in this particular case, um, the caller calls the coroutine, so that's the same as calling a function. But um, this shows off a couple of the extra capabilities of coroutines. So one is the coroutine can suspend, which transfers control flow back to its caller, and then the caller carries on, and then at some point later, the caller can initiate a resume of the coroutine, which transfers control flow back to the coroutine, and it resumes at the point where it was suspended. And then when the coroutine returns, it's uh, just like a function returning, control flow goes back to the calling, the calling function. So there's a couple of other inter interesting things that make coroutines different to functions, or at least more capable than functions than non-coroutine functions, I should say. So on the left there, uh, we see pretty much the same thing as we had on the previous slide, but the, the first caller can actually return back to its caller um, without resuming the coroutine, and the coroutine stays alive. So the lifetime of, of a coroutine is not intimately tied to the lifetime of its caller like a, like a regular function is. Uh, so then we can have some other function resume the coroutine sometime later. And that other function can be running on some other thread, for example. So there, there's, uh, there's, there's an interesting control flow uh, from the point of view of the coroutine that's possible there where the coroutine can suspend on one thread and potentially resume on a different thread. And the other interesting control flow that coroutines have is they can be destroyed. So on the right there, 
We see one caller calls the coroutine, the coroutine suspends, um, the control flow transfers back to the caller, and then later on the coroutine can be destroyed, which transfers the flow of control right to the very end of the coroutine where the destructors and everything run. Everything gets cleaned up and the bit in the middle of the coroutine is completely skipped. And that's, uh, that's quite useful, as we'll see a bit later on. So um, here's, a, here's a really simple example uh, of a coroutine. Um, it's on the, the right-hand side there, the coroutine. It's called Calculate. Um, it's, uh, it's a coroutine that's so nice I wrote it twice. Uh, the, uh, so it, it, all, all it does is it uh, performs some expensive calculation and then returns the result. So you can see there um, the first of the three new keywords, coroutine. And the, uh, the other inter interesting thing is the return type of this coroutine. So this lazy type is something that I've just invented out of whole cloth for this presentation. Uh, it's, and it's, um, that is where a lot of the customization points sit. So this slide shows two different, two different ways that this coroutine can be, can be used. So the first one, the one on the top, is where the caller calls the coroutine but never uses the result. So in that case, you can see when this lazy result goes out of scope, goes out of scope uh, the destructor of the coroutine is called, destroys the coroutine, oh, so, sorry, the destructor of the lazy class, destroys the coroutine and the expensive work um, is not done in that case because no one wanted it. Uh, the second case, you can see the caller calls the, this dot get, uh, which resumes the coroutine, performs the expensive work, returns a result, and uh, all as well. So, so this shows uh, sort of a, um, an artist's impression, I guess, of, um, of what the compiler does to the coroutine body. Uh, so this is not, a, this is not exact. Uh, there, there's, uh, it's not specified like this in the TS, but this is kind of what it, well, it, it, yeah. The TS has an example like this. I didn't just make it up. Uh, so um, so, so that on the left there is the coroutine body, uh, just the same as on the previous slide, except slightly more colorful. Uh, and on the right is what the, what the compiler uh, kind of generates under the covers. So. The first thing it does is it needs to find out the promise type. So that, that is the primary customization point for a coroutine. So it looks that up using, uh, using this class template called coroutine traits. Uh, so it feeds into that as template parameters, the return type of the coroutine, uh, and the types of any parameters. So there are no parameters in this case, which makes it easy. Um, so that, that, that coroutine trait specialization needs to define a promise type. So then um, an object of that type is created. Uh, it looks like a local variable here, but it's actually stored in something called the coroutine state, which is uh, a separate block of memory. Um, so I'll describe that soon. So then the, the, uh, the promise object, uh, P here, um, that gets asked for the return object, which is what the caller of the coroutine will receive as the return value. And then the promise is given an opportunity to provide an, an initial suspend. So the, uh, that allows the coroutine to suspend before executing any of the body. Uh, in the case of lazy, that's quite important because that, that's what allows it to not go and do the expensive work in the, in the, in the body of the coroutine until asked for. So I'll explain what co-await does shortly. Um, so co-await is the second of the three new keywords. So then the body of the, the original body of the coroutine is, is executed. Um, co-return turns into a call to return value on the promise object. So the promise object can decide what happens with that value that's being returned. And then because we're returning from the coroutine, um, there's a, we, we, we skip over the rest of the body with that go to. There's, there's no rest of the body in this case. Uh, if an exception is thrown, 
by the coroutine body, the, uh, the promise object gets a chance to handle that um, in its unhandled exception member. And then at the end of the body is the final suspend point, so the promise again gets a chance to, uh, to suspend the coroutine uh, at the end of the body, which is not useful for lazy, but it can be useful for, for other things. And then after that is the point where, um, where a destroy of the coroutine will jump to. So the coroutine state uh, is where the promise object um, copies of any parameters to the coroutine, uh, any local variables that the coroutine uses, um, and also any information that, uh, that is needed to identify where to resume the coroutine uh, is stored. So this is, this is some block of memory which is dynamically allocated. Uh, in a number of cases, and given a sufficiently smart compiler, uh, that that allocation can be elided, but in general, um, there has to be a dynamic allocation. Uh, and the, uh, the, the exact way that allocation happens is under, under the control of, uh, of the promise object again, well, the promise type, sorry. So, the, so this coroutine state gets created when the coroutine's called and gets destroyed um, at the end when control flows off the end of the body. So that can be either when the coroutine is destroyed or when it, uh, when it finishes its final suspend. So co-await, um, that again expands into more uh, kind of pseudocode. So on the left there, um, we've got a call to co-await. So x there is the thing that is being co-awaited. Uh, sometimes called an awaitable, but um, I have used the word awaitable to mean something subtly different in this talk, so th there's confusion over that terminology. I apologize for that. Um, so y is what co-await returns. Um, well, it's the result of the co-await expression. So on the right there is what the compiler uh, does for you. So this, uh, this h is a coroutine handle, so um, I'll say more about coroutine handle soon. But that's what, that's what allows um, the promise and, and, and cooperating classes to control the coroutine. So f first off, the promise object is given a chance to transform the awaited object. So the, if there's an await transform member in the promise type, then that gets past, uh, past x there. That's optional, so that doesn't have to be there. If, if that's not there, then a just becomes x. So then there's this new operator called co-await. So if there's a, if there's a operator co-await uh, for whatever A is, then that gets called and the result of that is used. Uh, if there isn't one, then E just becomes A. So then we've got E, which is, um, which is what I'm ref going to refer to as an awaitable. Uh, so that um, is another thing that allows you to customize the, the behavior of, of, of co-await. So that has three members. So the first is await ready, so that returns a bool, and that, uh, if that's true, then it means the coroutine will not suspend, and it will immediately carry on. If it's false, then the coroutine is considered suspended, and when the coroutine is suspended, that means it can be resumed or, or destroyed. So if it, is, if it is suspended, then await suspend is called, and that's past the coroutine handle. So that gets a chance to do something to the coroutine. It, it might want to stash that handle away. It might want to destroy the coroutine. It could even resume the coroutine. So after that, if the coroutine is still suspended, um, then control goes back to the caller. And then once the caller resumes the coroutine, control comes back here at that resume label, and then the coroutine is considered resumed. So then after all that's happened, uh, the awaitable gets a chance to supply the result of the co-await expression uh, via await resume. 
So co-yield is the third of the new keywords. Um, and if you weren't looking carefully, you might not have seen anything change on the screen there. So it's pretty much exactly the same as co-await. Uh, two differences. One is uh, the first customization point that the promise um, gets crack at is called yield value instead of await transform. Um, the other um, is uh, it sits in a slightly different point in the grammar, so the uh, precedence rules are different. But otherwise, it's, it works exactly the same. So while, while we're going through these transformations, there's, a, there's an extra one, uh, extra bit of syntax called for co-await, which is just like a range for loop with a co-await stuck in it, and that, uh, that gets transformed into the same thing as a range for loop, um, but with co-await stuck in it in a couple of places. So in particular, uh, there's a co-await on the result of begin on the range, which means that can be uh, could be an asynchronous operation or whatever the whatever the coroutine um, actually is, whatever co-await means in this context. And the other place is when um, when iterating the yeah. incrementing the iterator. So otherwise, it works just like a just like a range for loop, except the thing that's being ranged over is not is not a uh, not a range as uh, as per normal. It's sort of a sort of a an awaitable range. It's a, it's a different sort of concept where the um, begin on the range and the increment on the iterator has a slightly different type because it can be co-awaited. Well, it must be co-awaited. So I'll, I'll show an example of, of why this might be useful later. So coroutine handle, I mentioned. Uh, so this is kind of like um, a non-owning pointer uh, to the coroutine state. So it has, uh, it, it's destructive, doesn't do anything. That's the important thing to remember. Um, and it has a default constructive state where it doesn't point at any coroutine. So there's an operator ball which tells you whether it is in the default constructed state, or whether it's not. Uh, it provides a way of getting at the promise object, which is really useful. Uh, you can also go from the promise object to a corresponding coroutine handle. Uh, so these things can be trivially, well, not trivially, but easily copied. They're, 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 uh, they're really cheap, they're just a pointer, basically. And uh, the, the, guts of, the guts of what the coroutine handle is, is for is it allows you to resume or destroy the coroutine. So if you're dealing with one of these, you need to know whether the coroutine is currently suspended or not. Uh, if it is not suspended, then you must not call resume or destroy. Uh, there's not really any assistance for you in that regard. Um, so yeah. This is kind of for dealing with coroutine handles. Writing the coroutine abstractions is is kind of for uh, for people who are thinking very carefully. And it's fun to debug too. Okay, so quick word about um, return values. So so coroutines transfer control back um, in more than one way. So there's there's the first time they transfer control back to their caller, and that's when they return the actual return value of the coroutine. Uh, the, other, the other way they transfer control back is, uh, is when, when they suspend. So when the coroutine suspends, um, it, it will transfer control back either to the caller or, or, the, or the resumer. So the, the, there's just a m minor difference in terminology. The caller is what's expecting the actual return value of the coroutine. A resumer is something that uh, that doesn't get any return value back. So the first time the coroutine returns it re or suspends, it goes to its caller and it returns a value. Subsequent times, it goes to a resumer and doesn't return a value. Okay, so how do we actually implement this lazy, lazy kind of coroutine thing? So what we need to do is we need to 
implement a promise type, which I'm calling lazy promise, uh, which are forward declared because uh, the lazy class itself um, needs to refer to it and it needs to refer to the lazy class. So first of all, we define um, the, the lazy class template itself. So start with its private stuff. So the constructor is private because it's only, it's only ever constructed by the promise, by the promise object. So that's why the, that's why the promise type has made a friend. Uh, there's other ways of handling that, but for uh, exposition, I've done it that way. So when it's constructed, it gets passed a pro it gets passed a reference to the promise object, and it just converts it into a coroutine handle and stores that away. It also has uh, an optional storing the the value that's uh, that's been computed. It starts out empty uh, to indicate that we haven't computed the value yet. So then the public interface of of lazy is. Uh, basically just this get member. So what we do in there is we say, if we haven't got the value yet, we'll go and calculate the value, and then we'll return the value. So in order to calculate the value, we, uh, we, we resume the coroutine. So there's um, a little bit of an awkward interaction, um, which seems to often come up uh, with this stuff, um, where we need to tell the promise where it should store the value once it's been calculated because resume doesn't return anything. So there we're passing off the address of the optional that we're storing the, uh, storing the value in off to the promise. And then we resume the coroutine. So that resume will return once the coroutine has finished executing. Uh, then we uh, Null out our coroutine handle, um, which is important if you look at the destructor there. So in the destructor of lazy, uh, if we still have a coroutine handle, if the coroutine handle still points at a coroutine, which means that nobody ever called get, then we can destroy the coroutine and skip over the expensive calculation. So the lazy promise on the right there, uh, you can see it has a pointer to, a, to an optional. Um, which gets set when the lazy is ready to, resume, to receive the value that's calculated. So get return object returns, returns one of these lazy objects, uh, passing, a, passing a reference to the promise. Initial suspend uh, uses the special type, which is, in, um, which is part of the coroutines TS, uh, called suspend always. So that's, that's, a, uh, that's an awaitable type that always returns false from await ready. So that says we're going to suspend at the initial suspend point. So return value, so that's when the coroutine calls coreturn. Uh, then we populate the optional with, uh, with the value that was returned. Uh, unhandled exception, we swallow and do nothing because I didn't write that part. So that, um, there's also uh, yeah, there's, yeah, <laughs> you should probably do something with the exception in that case. So final suspend, uh, we use suspend never, which is another provided um, awaitable type, uh, which just returns true from, from await ready, so we don't suspend at the final suspend point, which means that the coroutine will be, uh, will fall off the end and uh, be cleaned up after it's, after it's returned. And then the final part of the puzzle is to specialize coroutine traits uh, for coroutines that return uh, any kind of lazy and take any arguments. And we just uh, say the promise type is uh, our lazy promise. OK, so now I'm going to say a few things about um, the usual suspects um, for coroutines. So lazy sequences and async stuff. I'm not going to say a lot about these. Um, there's, I think there's, there's uh, probably better talks about that stuff at this very conference. So uh, lazy sequences or generators, uh, the, uh, the coroutine is on the right here. So we've got something that returns a, a generator of int, which, uh, which just gives you a, 
uh, more, more, more or less infinite list of, uh, of prime numbers. And uh, the, the call is on the left there. It just looks like a normal loop, and it is a normal loop. Uh, the, uh, the nice thing there is that the, uh, the coroutine doesn't need to care about the termination condition. That's taken care of in the caller. So the caller just stops calling it when, it, when it's had enough, and, uh, and the coroutine won't, won't deliver any more values if it's not asked for them. So async stuff, this is probably you know, the, one of the big two killer features for, for coroutines, um, which I'm not saying much about in this talk. So let's say uh, we wanted to uh, have some sort of, I don't know, web service or something that, uh, that tells us whether a number's prime, and we want that to be asynchronous because it could take a while. So on the, on the right there, we've got a coroutine that uh, does a couple of asynchronous operations, uses co-await to uh, suspend uh, if the value is not available immediately. So th this, this return type task here is um, not completely invented out of whole cloth, uh, but it's not, it's not part of the coroutine TS. It's um, something that you need, to, you need to provide or find in a library. So then the caller uh, gets this task object back, and then in order to get the value out of it, it needs to use co-await. So the caller needs to be a coroutine. Uh, in this particular case, you, you could have a you could have a return value that doesn't require the caller to be a coroutine, but uh, things uh, things kind of line up more nicely if if they are. So 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 the nice thing about the nice thing about this is you can write your code. You can write normal loops and ifs and things um, as though everything was synchronous. Just uh, sprinkle a co-await here and there, but it's actually asynchronous and will suspend the operation until the result's ready. So you can combine the two uh, and have an async generator. So uh, that's something that works just like a generator, but instead of using a range four loop over it, you can use a, a range four co-await loop. Um, so if you want to use this stuff now, um, you can. Uh, so as far as I know, there are two, two working implementations of the, of the TS. Um, Visual Studio has had an implementation since 2015, I think. Um, 2017 is recommended. And you just need the slash await flag. Um, Clang 5.0 um, with, uh, with libc++ has an implementation, uh, which is pretty cool. So that just gets you the raw TS, which gives you coroutine handle and coroutine traits and a couple of other things. Uh, it doesn't really let you build, well, it lets you build everything, but it doesn't give you any, any uh, high-level abstractions. So there's a few libraries that I know of um, that provide some of these abstractions. So one called CPP Coro, or Coro, I don't know. Um, so that provides um, task, um, generator, async generator, some async mutex stuff, um, some, other, some other really uh, cool stuff for dealing with, dealing with async things. Um, highly recommend that. Uh, uh, the range v3 library um, has a generator implementation which works nicely with um, with the with the range v3 library um, I am certain there are others so if you are working on any or know of any that, that are awesome please let me know I, I'm always interested to find that find it out about this stuff so it's going to say a couple of things about slightly unconventional things you can do with coroutines so this is this is my Personal interest um, in the well, my sub-interest in the in the coroutine space. So let's consider an example where we have uh, some 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 functions that return uh, optional values. So say say we're wanting to parse some values out of a out of a stream. So we can read a word and it'll either return a string, which is the word, or an empty optional, which 
uh, would be the case if there isn't a word in the stream. Uh, so similarly, we can parse an int. It either gives you an int if there is one, or if there isn't, it doesn't. And parse double, and then the interesting thing which we're going to implement is uh, a combination of parse int and parse double, so called parse vector. So we're going to parse the count first, which is an int, and then that many doubles. And it either gives you a vector, or if, uh, if the stream doesn't contain an int followed by that many doubles, then, uh, then it will give you um, an empty optional. So, so this is kind of how I'd write that, uh, not, not using anything fancy. So, so we call parseInt, that gives us an optional back. We need to check if it's empty, then we can return empty. If it's not, then we can carry on, use that number, and then we just loop over that many times, call parse double, it gives us an optional, we check if it's empty. If it, if it is empty, we, re we return empty, otherwise we carry on to the next one. So it is possible to write this as a coroutine and remove a lot of the boilerplate code. Uh, so you'll notice the, the ifs have gone and all the early returns have gone, but this actually works the same way as the previous one. So we've put, we've put co-await in the places where, um, where we want to unwrap an optional, and uh, inside that, uh, that can cause the coroutine to exit early and return an, an empty optional or it can carry on. So, how can this be possible? Uh, well, strictly speaking, it's kind of not if you're talking about standard optional. Uh, is a, my understanding is that um, it's not allowed to specialize a, a, a class template from the standard namespace without any user-defined types in it. Um, but uh, it works anyway, so. You can, yeah, you can, yeah, it works. So, so we're, uh, we, we're using a, we're specifying a promise type here called optional promise. So this optional promise um, in its await transform, uh, it says that you're allowed to await, well, if you await on any kind of optional, um, then we're gonna return this special optional awaitable type, which is going to control suspension, etc. So the awaitable. So in await ready, uh, if the optional that was co-awaited on has a value, then await ready returns true, which means the coroutine just carries on without suspending, um, and then goes to await resume, which just, un which just takes the value out of the optional. Um, if the optional doesn't have a value, then we go into await suspend we get given a handle to the coroutine, uh, and then we just destroy the coroutine. And, uh, well, we, we tell the promise somehow that we're going to return an empty optional. Um, that bit's a bit tricky. Um, I haven't mentioned that here. Uh, there's code on GitHub if you want the gory details of how that works. But um, we destroy the coroutine, which means that we don't execute the rest of it. So what if optional is not quite enough information. Um, well, luckily, uh, the exact same approach works uh, if you've got something that's like optional. So, for example, if you had a, an expected class template, which could e either be a value or some kind of error, uh, you could use that. Uh, the, uh, the, the implementation of the coroutine stuff for that is pretty much the same. So if you want to play with um, play with optional coroutines, there's um, yeah you know, I wouldn't say if you want to use it in production, but if you want to play with it, there's uh, so there's um, some stuff on on my GitHub uh, which works with um, standard optional, uh, but only works on Clang, uh, unfortunately. Uh, there's a basic expected implementation as well there. Uh, just recently. Um, the folly optional type from Facebook 
um, has grown support for coroutines. Um, which, so that's not standard optional, but it's still a pretty good optional. Uh, it's a good option, you could say. Uh, so, and the uh, the magic there is that works on Clang and uh, and MSVC, um, which is which is pretty clever. So, uh, there's uh, there's also a fully expected, which doesn't yet have coroutine support. So, uh, that would be that would be a, um, quite a quite a good little project uh, if someone wanted to. Play around with the stuff. I'm sure they'd appreciate a pull request. So the other potentially interesting idea. Um, so this is, this is something that I stole from uh, from from Gore. Uh, is that you can you can get a kind of type erasure um, out of out of the coroutine machinery. So the uh, the interesting thing. Well, I don't know. But, <clears throat> the thing is that the body of a coroutine can can have more type information than the actual than the return type of the coroutine. So this um, this is this is probably a bit hard to digest this code, honestly. But um, but what we've got we've got a we've got a a coroutine there. This uh, that create function there is a coroutine. So it's a it's a it's a static member function, which is cool. Coroutines can be static or non-static member functions. Uh, so this this is a template also. So that that template parameter f is more specific type information than is apparent in the return value of that coroutine. So that coroutine um, its return type just encodes the the return type in the arguments. Of the function, not the actual type of the function. And when that coroutine uh, yields the function, um, the yield value member in the promise type on the right there gets called, and that can be a template. So that can recover the uh, the exact type of the function. So using this, you can build something that's kind of like kind of like std function, uh, but just works completely differently. Uh, so one of the nice things about that is that if if the compiler can see everything you're putting into this into this uh, this this coroutine func thing, um, and it can see the caller, then um, then it can potentially inline everything and get rid of all of the all of the allocations uh, and make all of the coroutine machinery go away. Uh, it's quite a quite a cool thing to see. Uh, um, when I when I say the compiler, I mean Clan currently, but hopefully other compilers in the future as well. Um, otherwise, if the compiler can't see everything, it's it has it's going to have overhead. It's going to have dynamic allocation. It's going to have essentially Essentially, virtual dispatch in there, so it's not going to be much different to uh, just a function. Uh, I think mostly this is interesting, just as a sort of bit of a head scratcher and a and a uh, uh, you know that's interesting. What can we build? What can we build with that? Um, so there's some um, there's some code on my GitHub to play with. I wouldn't say it's useful as it is, but it's um, it's intriguing. So, in summary, coroutines are a generalization of functions. So that's uh, that's a message that I think is important to to uh, bear in mind. Coroutines are functions; they're just functions that have extra capabilities. So the usual suspects for for coroutines that we talked about: generators, um, async things, and async generators even. Um, I think that's probably going to be the uh, the, the vast majority of uses of coroutines. Um, but I think there's a lot of other interesting applications of coroutines that we're only just starting to explore. So there's the optional and expected case. Um, I'm currently working on trying to extend that to uh, to other monadic operations. Um, there's the type erasure example, which I'm sure. Has some interesting applications, and I really want to hear what they are. Um, so, thank you very much for your attention, uh, and I'll be happy to take any questions.
Yeah, go ahead. Um, hi, as someone who programs in Haskell occasionally, uh, my spidey sense tingled throughout the talk. It seems like coroutines are very similar or an extension of or a special case of monads. I was wondering if you could talk about that at all. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, um, yeah, that, that's, um, that's, that's along my line of thinking exactly. Uh, the, the, uh, so so co coroutines themselves don't have a lot to do with monads, I think. But uh, you can build something similar to Haskell's do notation, uh, which is what I, what I was thinking with the optional, uh, the optional example there. Um, so I don't think you can build the full general generality of, of monads using coroutines. Uh, for example, um, the non-determinism monad uh, requires um, requires going back and executing parts of the coroutine again, and that's simply not possible with the coroutines to TS. You can only move forward um, and can't go back in time. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, we can't build build everything that Haskell has, but. Uh, um, it's certainly possible to build um, a really useful subset, and um, I'd love somebody to tell me what category theoretical subset that is. Monads are the monoids in the category of endofunctors. Didn't you know that? I have no idea what that means. <laughs> yeah. No, I thought they were burritos. But <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, 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 oh alternate. So um, when you spoke about the type erased uh, callable, so you said like in principle if the compiler can see uh, you know this much of the code, then it can optimize things away. It, it seems to me that that's pretty similar to saying like if on line one you assign a lambda to a std function, and then on line two you call it, the compiler can optimize that out because it knows what that std function holds. Um, so I guess I, I didn't really sort of get it. Uh, like, what is, what are coroutines letting us do uh, here that's unique, I guess? Because it seems like the situation is still pretty much the same. Like, if you type a race, you might be able to get the optimization if the compiler can see enough code and sort of draw a line between them. And if not, then in general, you won't. So what's different with coroutines? Not a lot. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Your your observation is is correct. There's nothing stopping the compiler doing the same optimizations for a for a std function. Um, it's just not as good at it. It's, um, so I mean, I'm, I'm not even claiming that there's really an advantage to the coroutine version. It, it's it's just it's just interesting that that capability exists within the coroutine system, uh, and uh, mostly I want to sort of. Uh, prod people into thinking about what cool stuff they can build with that because I'm sure there's something cool you can build there. Um, I haven't figured it out. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the the function thing is just an example to show that it it can work. Okay. <laughs> I don't have a better answer. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I think I think we probably need to wrap up now. Um, oh, no. Well, I can take a couple more questions. Cool. Hi, so on uh, the slide, it was like two of N for implementing lazy. <laughs> yes. Uh, you made a comment about the, uh, you called it like a friction of having to, the promise and the value having to like sh both know where the result is going to be. And I noticed that you put the storage in the return value and pass a pointer, the, the address of that into the promise sort of after the fact. Uh, when I was playing with coroutines, my intuition was to do it the opposite way. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate why you did it that way, if there's pros and cons. Because I actually put the storage for the return value in the promise and just gave the return value knowledge of where that was. Mm. So, so in that particular case, um, it ha um, so yeah, in that particular case, it's because I wanted to be able to destroy the coroutine, well, have to have the coroutine cleaned up uh, while the lazy object itself was still alive. Uh, so if the coroutine runs off the end, the promise gets destroyed. So if the value is stored in the promise, it won't be available after the execution is finished. Now, it, it's, it's possible to implement it uh, such that the coroutine suspends at the, at the end, and then the promise is available still. 
So that, that's a that's a completely valid implementation right. tool as well. I think that's actually what I ended up doing. Now that you describe it, and is there something that comes to mind as to what what the advantages or disadvantages would be? Well, the only thing, the only advantage I can think of of um, well, I think in the lazy case, there's not much advantage to keeping the coroutine state around. It's just kind of wasted, wasted memory. Um, okay. the, in more complicated cases, uh, the promise has more responsibilities, and, and it would be it would be a different trade-off. Right. Okay. Right, thanks. Thanks. I uh, have two concerns in like highly threaded environments using coroutines. Uh, one, the coroutine state, there doesn't seem to be an allocator that can be passed into coroutines. Um, um, the, so, yeah, there is, there is um, a customization point for allocation. The, 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 uh, there's a, uh, the, if there's a uh, operator new in the promise type, um, that, gets, that gets used. Um, so, in terms of passing an allocator in, um, that is possible. Um, the, parameter, the parameters to the coroutine get passed to the operator new, so it's possible to extract the allocator. It's a bit awkward, okay. but it's possible. Uh, my other concern is uh, previously, like on Windows, uh, using fibers for uh, coroutine style uh, coding uh, had a huge issue with red local storage with the context switching. Um, is that still an issue uh, with uh, this coroutines library? Uh, so I'm not sure what what issue you were having. What, what, what was the issue? Uh, there, there was an uh, old bug in Windows where it would uh, screw up the thread local storage using uh, their fiber implementation. Um, they, they fixed it with a compiler flag. There's a lot of old libraries that you could potentially pull in, or if they didn't compile it with that special flag, you'd still get screwed up thread local storage. I was wondering if that okay. is an I'm, issue. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the issue, so uh, I, I couldn't say if it, if it is an issue with coroutines. Okay. Uh, I mean, something to be aware of with thread local storage um, in a coroutine is that um, in, in some cases uh, the coroutine might change threads in the middle. Yeah. Um, every, everywhere it suspends, it, it could resume on a different thread, so mm -hmm. thread local storage might not do what you expect. Um, I don't know if that's related to the issue you're talking about or not. Uh, is there any thoughts of like coroutine local storage? Uh, in this proposal. Right. Cool. Yeah. Are there um, any, is anyone thinking about adding coroutine local storage? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, okay. Thanks everyone. Feel free to um, uh, grab, me, uh, grab me around the conference and talk about this stuff. Thank you.